Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this afternoon's Cup of Club with Bristol Energy Cooperative and Solar for Schools Community Benefit Society with Andy and Robert. Andy is a founding, founder director of Bristol Energy, and Robert is a founder and CEO of Solar Options for Schools, which manages the assets on behalf of Solar for Schools and is also a director of Solar for Schools Community Benefit Society. My name's Paul Pizzala, and I'm Senior Investment Manager at FX, working with Andy on Roberts on their community share and community bond offers. So before we get started, there is a little bit of housekeeping to do. And um, I'd like to let you know that the Copper Club is recorded and made available to watch via YouTube. And we also ed edit this down to a highlights version, which we'll send around too. Um, to say that this is not a financial promotion, and if you do need financial advice, please do speak to an independent advisor. As many of our regular couple clubbers will know, um, the session usually runs for 30 to 45 minutes, and it's a really fantastic opportunity to meet and ask questions of the directors and hear about why both Bristol Energy Cooperative and Solar for Schools are such impactful organisations. Um, also to ask how they achieve their goals, what your investment is funding, and both the challenges and opportunities in the current environment. So please do feel free to ask questions and to drop them in the chat box, and we'll take those questions as we go along. So before Andy and Robert introduce themselves and their respective organizations. Both the offers are live on FX's platform and are targeting raising 1 million and 1.5 million pounds respectively, principally to provide the capital for rooftop solar projects. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Beck or Bristol Energy Cooperative are offering shares at 5%. And Solar for Schools are offering bonds that can be held in an innovative finance ISA with an index linked return up to 5%. And please do refer to the documents for more details after the webinar. So without any more further ado, um, I'd like to ask Andy and Robert to introduce themselves and maybe if we can kick off with Andy, please. Okay, uh, thanks Paul. Um, hello everybody, uh, thanks for having me on today. So yeah, my name is Andy O'Brien. I'm a, a co-founder and director of Bristol Energy Cooperative. Um, we started back in 2011. At that stage, we were all volunteers. Um, and now we've got to the point where we have um, eight staff members. Um, our board is still voluntary, those directors, uh, but yeah, eight staff paid members working on lots and lots of projects now, which is which is great to to get to that point um, after a lot of a lot of work really over the last decade. Um, so this is our ninth share offer that we've run uh, to, to fund our projects. And in total over the years, we've raised 15 million pounds and about half of that has come from um, community crowdfunding. Or, so that's either shares or bonds. Um, much of that's been through the FX platform. And then the other half has come through uh, traditional loan financing from, from banks. Um, and that's helped us develop our, our portfolio. And that portfolio at the moment is primarily solar, um, but also over the last few years, we've, we've been moving into more integrated technologies as well. So at the moment, we we have 14 rooftop schemes with PV, uh, two solar farms, um, and those two farms actually provide the majority of our revenue at the moment. We have a battery storage scheme that we started quite a few years ago as a bit of a pilot scheme to see how that would go. And since then, we've branched out into uh, funding microgrids. And also, we're also now a part funder of a large scale grid battery, um, which is in Bristol. So you can see it's quite a, quite a mix of technologies. Um, we think that's really important to be doing a different mix and integrating as much as possible. So that's what we've got in terms of um, assets. Um, but key thing also to say is that we are a community benefit society. Um, which means that we exist to provide a benefit to the community. 
the different ways we can do that. One of them is actually providing um, energy bill savings for the, uh, for example, the community buildings that we work with, where we've got solar panels on their roofs, they get subsidized energy uh, from buying, buying our energy from us, sorry, buying their energy from us. Um, but also we actually provide revenues from our schemes into a community benefit fund. Uh, we've got one which we run with a neighboring co-op. And over the years, we've managed to put £350,000 into community benefit to the wider community. So that's that's key. Um, and we need to be doing more of that. And it's really key that we get more and more members because the more people that join, uh, the more we grow, the more we share the message about why community energy is good, the more people get up to speed with how it all works. So there's a there's a there's a lots of benefits there. Um, so people are investing for it, yes, for a financial return, but also for a, a social and an environmental one as well. I think that's probably enough for me. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. That's great. And Robert, do you want to um, set the scene for Solar for Schools, please? Yeah, thank you. Hard act to follow. Uh, so my name is Robert Schrempf. I'm, as uh, mentioned, uh, director of Solar Options for Schools, who sort of does the management piece, and the Solar for Schools CBS. Um, one of the questions I'm often asked is, you know, why Solar for Schools? And there was a bit of a journey. I, I Seven years ago, I used to be a uh, an investor, a partner in a fund investing in early stage technology companies, a job I love very much, but uh, I became increasingly frustrated by the time it was taking these companies to make a difference. And it wasn't because the technology was a problem. Yes, it took a while to mature, but it was mainly because of market adoption. And so the thought of you know, how, how do we accelerate the deployment of some of the existing technologies such as solar and wind uh, much faster. And at the time I was working with, a, a gov with the government on trying to get more solar onto rooftops. And one of the biggest challenges is that often the owner of the building and the person using the electricity within it are not the same person. And that causes a problem when you're trying to finance solar on a project. And public buildings don't tend to have that problem. And within public buildings, schools tend to have nice large roofs, tend to consume electricity during the day, uh, and are very likely to be around for 25 years schools don't typically go out of business. And so therefore they were a very safe place to put solar panels, but that's not the main driver we did it. When the penny really dropped was when I was having a conversation with a neighbor who was bragging about how he was building this lovely house, um, but he's getting around the rules of having to put solar panels on it and a heat pump, he's just gonna go for a gas boiler. And this guy worked for an insurance company and working for the insurance company, it should be pretty obvious that climate change is coming and what the risks entailed. Yet he was proud of the fact that he was getting around the rules doing the most obvious things. And no amount of arguing from my side around the financials, the environmental impact, um, society didn't, didn't cut it. Look, my wife doesn't like the look of solar panels. I've already made the decision too late. I went home feeling rather depressed and um, Say, crumbs, if someone who works in the insurance industry who's got the money to do the right thing isn't doing it, what hope do the rest of us have? I mean, just this is not going to work. And I went home, mentioned this to my daughter. And I've told this story many times, but it still makes me have to swallow. And she went around and spoke to the neighbor's daughter, who were friends, and they approached the neighbor, their father. And I still don't know to this day what they said to him. But what I do know is that he called me a few days later and said he changed his mind and he was going to install a heat pump and solar panels. And then I realized the power of the next generation. They care about the future and they have the most influential power of anyone on our generation. Yet they're currently powerless and in the dark about what they can do about it. So we need to educate children as to what they can do and show them how powerful they are in making a change. But the problem is that most of the charities have tried to do this, have struggled. And I'm a trustee of Energy Sparks, who managed to raise quite a lot of money to do some really great work around energy education in schools. But once those funders have funded it for two or three years, they kind of lose interest. And so most of these charities then, unfortunately, then fail. And what's so beautiful about Solar for Schools is that we combine the income generated from the solar panels to continuously 
pay for that education delivery. But not just that, the solar panels are an intrinsic part of that learning opportunity. They're a practical way of seeing it happen and being able to then explain it to their parents and people around them. So that's what, to me, was so exciting about um, solar schools and why I left my nicely paid and comfortable job as a venture capitalist seven years ago um, to set this up. And it's been a hard, hard journey. Um, the idea was to use software and technology to digitalize the process of helping a school go solar. So that's what Solar Options for Schools does. We provide a whole wealth of tools so we can analyze any school in the UK in seconds and provide an offer to school in minutes. And the idea is to provide that tool to community energy groups and councils around the country to do that. But the second part of it was how to fund it. Most schools don't have the money to do solar. And that's where the Solar for Schools Community Benefit Society comes in. And that was created a little bit different to most community um, groups, which is not around a, a local community, but around a UK wide community of schools. And the members are the schools themselves. So any profits or any surpluses go back to the schools. We don't have a separate fund that allocates it to a local uh, entity. It literally goes back to the schools in proportion to how effective each of their projects has been. And the schools then get to vote on the directors and uh, uh, governance and allocation of those surpluses back to those schools or more educational materials. So that's why this is with us two, the two hats. And the CBS itself doesn't employ anybody. It purely holds the assets and manages the money. So it's a relatively clean and simple structure with all the risk being taken by solar options for schools. If a project goes wrong, we take that risk. Um, if a project fails or doesn't happen, we take that risk. So it protects the CBS from uh, most of those risks. And that's why there's, there's two, two boxes. And I happen to sit with one hat in both. Um, but the CBS directors could fire me if they wanted to, and it could be completely independent, and they could choose someone else to manage it too if they wanted to. Hopefully they won't do that because one of the key bits of value that we add are, is the education piece that we'll come back to later. Um, thank you, Robert. That's 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 a fantastic um, introduction to Solar for Schools and also understanding where Solar for Options, Solar Options for Schools fits into the picture. Um, and also really interesting to have two different solar renewable energy models on the platform at the moment and we can kind of like get into the details of that a little bit more perhaps with this next question <clears throat> so for for andy and robert you, you both have long track records in the renewable se energy sector it's pretty pretty obvious you're highly experienced and an expert at what you do um and we now know that you know more than ever energy is at the heart of the, of the climate and, and the cost of living crisis, crises, as well as being a part of the solution. So can you, can you tell us why it's so important to galvanize local communities in the case of Bristol, in the case of Bristol or, or city communities? So kind of interested to you know, get into the detail of that a little bit more. And, and in Robert's case, you've already, you've already touched on, you know, why it's the, the, the direct impact you're having and um, you're know, over and above reducing CO2. So, you know, Robert, if you want to skip over that bit, that's absolutely fine. But sort of interested to hear how you think about the community aspects in, in both of your organizations. Maybe you can start, start off with Andy. Okay, yeah. So for me, I mean, community energy provides practical optimism. Um, yeah, I got involved at the very beginning because I felt, oh, Got to do something hands on uh, so what can we do and i was by no means an energy expert at all uh, but i've learned quite a bit along the way and i think you could say that for a lot of the population they don't know that much about energy you know they tend to switch on a light and it comes on and they don't tend to think about how it all works behind the scenes and you know, that much bigger picture um so what community energy does it brings it down to the local level where people can actually see solar panels going up on their local community building or a local school and that that starts a conversation and that's really important and when then people have the opportunity to invest in it as well they're they're, <laughs> they're financially invested they're emotionally invested and it starts up all sorts of conversations so that's why it's important it's also really important right now if you look actually what the um 
what the, you know, the, the government's own committee on climate change is saying, have been saying for a very long time, is that we're only really going to go net zero if we have everybody working together. And that is the communities, the local authorities and the commercial sector. And it's quite hard to bring those all those three together. But community energy is a really good way of doing that. It's, it's, it, again, it's surprising. We do a lot of work at Bristol City Council. and. Everybody knows right now, councils are cash strapped. So there are lots of things they would like to do, but actually maybe don't have the funds for. We need to prioritise their funds elsewhere. So we can actually step in and, and fund things. And that's actually what we did with our, our latest um, solar installation at the Bottle Yard Film Studios, uh, where it's uh, like a million pound budget that we, we, we took over from them. Um, and it's hope. It's hope and actually providing in the real information. I mean, we are at the point now where, frankly, personally, I'm sick and tired of hearing falsehoods being told about renewables and how they don't work at great scale. And, you know, we don't have an issue. I don't have an answer for when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. We have all that. The technology exists. Renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. Huge subsidies continue to go into fossil fuels. And again, just like people maybe don't know much about the energy system itself, they don't know anything about the finances of it. I mean, to give you a really practical example, uh, right now you know, with the energy crisis and the windfall tax that the big fossil fuel companies are having to pay, there is actually what I would call a loophole in that if they actually put those taxes that they're meant to be paying back into um, finding more sources of fossil fuel, they will get a rebate of up to 91%, 91%. Now we know we need to get the fossil fuels in the ground anyway, and yet they're being given this massive subsidy to go and do more of it. So here we are, you know, everyone's worried about, you know, where do we, where do we pay for fixing the potholes in the road, fixing the sewage issues, paying, helping people to just eat, eat, you know, we've got all these existential questions going on at a really local level, but at a national level, we've just been given this totally skewed picture about how it, how we can't do things differently. And so that has to change. And again, community energy is really good at doing that. And across the country, there are maybe 300 community energy groups doing lots of different things, whether it's energy efficiency, um, new renewables projects, and everything in between. And Community Energy England as a trade body lobbies very hard for the government to, to change its ways. And we have to keep doing that. And again, it's like Robert was there talking there, really. you talk to your neighbours about it, about this sort of thing. That That's a really good way of changing people's attitudes and getting people up to speed. So for me, yeah, Community Energy is really important from, from those aspects, really. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Sorry, sorry, Robert, you go. No, sorry, I, I was about to sort of, I completely agree. I think um, I think individuals underestimate their ability to drive change. And there's growing research that shows that whilst I was unsuccessful talking to my neighbour, yeah. those type of conversations are actually generally very, very useful. Um, and whilst I on my own didn't move the needle, others managed to, in this case, my daughter and, and their friend, but multiple conversations do make a difference. And, and you see it here. I have had solar panels in nearly 10 years, um, and most of my neighbours now have solar panels. At some point, they'll come up and talk to you about it. And if you can encourage them to go ahead, that makes a difference. So the community aspect is super strong. The, the other thing is that um, schools, from just looking at our perspective specifically, are amazing multipliers. Most people walk into school on a regular basis. They have children. They, they see the solar panels on a, on a roof. Um, that acts as yet another sort of incentivization or nudge to, 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 to do something about it. Um, but the challenge with schools, and this is where communities come in again, is that they're incredibly hard to get across the line. For a school to say yes, to sign up to a, to a, a solar agreement, which are 25 year long agreements, it, it requires a lot of people to say yes and only one person to say no. And it only requires one person to have heard you know, that, that solar panels never produce enough electricity to cover their own making, you know, a myth from 30 years ago, uh, to, for the project to stop. Or, oh, they don't work, 
because they heard it from someone else and it stops. It, it, so those conversations showing people that it does work make a massive, massive difference and, and smooth the process. Mm. It, it could take 18 months to two years for a school to go ahead. And the ones that move fastest are often the ones where we're working with a local community energy group um, who've driven that. And then it can happen in months. So as individuals, you can have a huge influence collectively. Um, so yeah, I think the community is incredibly important and we're very, very keen to work with more communities on, on, on getting more schools across the line. Yeah, re really, really strong multiplier effect at that grassroots community level, which is you know brilliant to hear. So sometimes I think we, we neglect to talk about that aspect and it's really good to hear you both talk about it. Um, I'm, I've got a question from LA, um, not LA the place, but LA the person. So I'll, I'll, Robert, you might see that. Maybe we, we can pick that question up later, something to do with environmental tax reliefs. Um, but I wanted to sort of get, get onto the, you know, a bit on the macro scene. Um, so in terms of the volatility of energy prices, so we can't really neglect to talk about that, both as a, an input cost and as a sales price. Um, you know, typically I think, in, in my view, so so the solar energy business models are fairly plain vanilla. But I just wonder if you can tell us about how you've been managing the respective the risks in your respective businesses of volatile energy prices. And can you tell us practically how both Beck and Solar for Schools have been able to help with the cost of living? For instance, with the community funds, Andy, that you've talked about a little bit and reduced costs of energy, which you touched on as well, Robert. Um, so, so volatile electricity prices are a big issue. I mean, it's something that we spend a huge amount of time thinking about. Now, on the, on the one hand, rising electricity prices, you might argue, are a boom for solar because it makes solar prices look cheap in comparison. Um, so I used to joke rather badly that Putin was our best, uh, our best partner, um, but uh, really high electricity prices are completely unsustainable. Uh, so that's not going to work in the long time. But it brings a second problem, which is historically, electricity prices always rose a couple of percentage faster than inflation. And when a school is signing up to a sort of 25 year agreement, it then has some kind of reassurance that they're never going to be paying more for their solar electricity than their mains because of that historic divergence. Uh, so as long as you started below mains electricity price, you'd always remain below mains electricity price. We're currently in a world very different to that, where following a huge increase of 300% in some extreme cases, we're now seeing prices coming back down again. Yet the cost of installing solar has gone up about 20%. Um, so we've got higher PPA prices than 18 months ago, but electricity prices coming back down again. So there's now a risk that a school could enter into a solar agreement or any business could enter into a solar agreement now at a price that's below what they're currently paying, but their mains electricity prices come, come down and inflation pushes it beyond it. So a year from, or two from now, they could be in an embarrassing situation where they have to explain why they're paying more for their solar than they're from their mains. Clearly an untenable situation. Um, whilst we think schools would still pay their electricity bills if they were in that situation, it's not a situation you want to end up in. And therefore, Trying to forecast what electricity prices are going to settle on is something that we spent a huge amount of time thinking about. Now, at the moment, our internal view is we should not be encouraging anyone to enter into PPA anywhere close to 25p. There should be a few pence below that. But that brings the second challenge in. At the moment, we're trying to raise money, and we're both raising at roughly the same rate, 5%. And 5% in a world of 13% inflation doesn't sound very much. Right. OK, it's still a couple percent more than than uh, the bank will pay you, but it's not a huge amount yet. Increasing it from just from five to six percent, which wouldn't make a huge amount of difference to one as an individual investor, makes a big difference to the economics of what we're doing. It's effectively a 20 percent increase in one of our costs, the interest bearing cost and interest costs at the beginning of a project are a very large chunk, up to a third of or, or, or more, depending on the project of the total costs. So a increase from five to 6% on in, uh, interest we pay would actually increase the cost to schools by one to two pennies. 
And that one to two pennies could be the difference of them going ahead or not. So we're in this difficult challenge because of electricity prices of trying to navigate between continuing to provide a saving to schools. Because at the end of the day, our main objective is to provide a saving to schools so that they go ahead so that we can do the education piece. Uh, and so balancing that is quite challenging. Now, touching on the sort of core cool part of the question around how, what are we doing about it? Within the Solar for Schools CBS, we do have a situation where if it temporarily crosses, that we can hold the increase, the RPI increase back for school. So we have that internal process. But ultimately, our goal is to try and keep that electricity price as low as possible for schools, because schools being uh, paid for by the public purse, effectively, the more we can save a school, the more society benefits as a whole. And therefore, that balance between trying to keep our interest costs or what we offer our, our bondholders um, as low as possible. Um, and part of us would love to offer a higher rate of interest, but then that's going to have a bigger impact on the schools. So it's that balance. Great. Thanks, Robert. Andy? Go. Um, so I, I think I split my answer into two, two areas. One, the sort of the rooftop schemes that we do, and then the, the solar farms. Um, so the when we yeah when when we talk to um the the user of the electricity at the building which often is a tenant rather than the um, the landlord we yeah we agree with them in an, an initial price and typically we that is index linked to inflation uh, and that's that's the way we've done most of our schemes up to now um there are some discussions with other people right now about maybe having a, a cap and that sort of thing but that is the way traditionally we've done it so that gives the users the electricity to the price certainty, apart from you know, how big or small inflation ends up being. Uh, and also it gives us a certainty because we need to look at, like say, a 25 year model, um, at, but have you know, the, the large up cost of buying the system at the beginning. So we need to know that we have enough money to cover that. So that's, that's traditionally how we've been doing that. Um, and as I say, we're still doing that, but right now it's, it's really quite, Difficult when you're when you're talking to prospective energy users as as to where the starting point is right now. I mean, you know, a few years ago, we the typical rate we would be say eight pence per unit that they would be paying for that electricity. But right now, if you look at what they're paying, if they've got they still have the existing other contract for you know the electricity they're not using from our sorry if our roof isn't isn't providing enough electricity, they still need to get additional electricity. So on that contract with their other supplier, that's likely to be an awful lot higher right now. And so the question is, well, where do we start? What, where do we pitch our starting unit price at? You know, 8p, 50p or somewhere in between. And it's, it's, it's quite difficult for anybody to know really. But we do find that people like the idea of the price certainty. At least they know where it's gonna be. Um, so that's on the rooftop schemes. Um, on the solar farms, it's a bit different. Um, they both get the feed-in tariff. And so that, that, that actually breaks down into two areas with a generation element and, and an export element. So we get um, from the government a certain amount, which is index linked for every unit we generate. And then also for what is either exported, we can choose to get another payment from the government, which is index linked, or we can sell that on the open market. And previously it'd been better just to stick with what the government gave us because it was slightly higher um of late it's changed and it's you know, having actually selling up on the market open market is better and um, so that's what we've been doing and um, we'll probably do that at least for the next few years um but again it's a bit like mortgages you know if you have a mortgage you go for a short-term mortgage or you go for a long-term mortgage and what you know how much certainty do you want to lock in so at the moment, we're going fairly short term, but one of the big things coming through, which is really good for us, is that Bristol City Council and other councils are beginning to develop what they call sleeving arrangements. They're looking to procure their own energy for their assets from local renewable sources. So they're very keen to enter into long-term power purchase agreements with people like us. And mm -hmm. um, so again, if we, if it's a decent, rate you know it has to be worth our while so to speak um then we would be very keen to 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 do those with them because it 
it, you know, it makes a beautiful sort of virtuous circle of everything being used locally. Um, and also having that long-term PPA rate just helps us from the outset know that, that we've got that income coming in. Whereas if you're on one year, what short-term contracts, you never quite know. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Andy. That's 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 super. We've got a few questions coming naturally, which I'm gonna some are more technical than others around um, stamp duty tax relief. And have you considered that in your projects? And a question for solar for schools, how do you sell the excess production? Um, and from RJ, who's so in the north who's in the Northwest, um, starting towards the hardest part, or, and we're discovering the requirement to be incorporated and having fund available to get us going. What kind of organize, organizations did you go for? So I, I'm just peppering those questions, peppering you with those questions in case uh, you can make a connection whilst I dive into the, into the next part of the webinar with you. So question for Andy, Beck, Beck as you alluded to, has grown consistently over the past 15 years, primarily investing in solar ground mounted assets and some notable rooftop lamp schemes. Um, as the energy transition gathers pace, i.e. being able to store more intermittent energy like solar and wind, um, it's, it's vital to, to manage the national grid. In, in my, in, that's my sort of basic understanding. I'm sure you'll tell me otherwise if, if that's not correct. As such, you, you're investing in, in battery storage. Can you tell us a little bit about that project that, that Beck is working on and how you see Beck developing over the next five years, given that you know the energy transition is underway and we do need back, battery storage to, to manage intermitt intermittency? Yeah, sure. Um... So we've got, I suppose, three projects that have an element of battery storage. Um, the first one is um, the one which I mentioned at the sort of initially. Um, so this is a fairly small battery, um, which is actually in, in Winchester, of all places, um, which is on the new build housing estate where um, we, we wanted, yeah, wanted to get into on site treat it as a bit of a pilot and, and learn how, how the whole uh, industry is working in terms of what batteries can do in both uh, providing electricity to the grid when there's a shortage, but also drawing excess electricity from the grid when they need to do that as well to keep the whole frequency stable and the grid stable. Um, so that was that one's actually been running for quite a few years now. Um, and then that led us to uh, start investing in microgrids. Uh, more locally, so this this is our, this is our new build housing schemes where you know we we wanted to integrate solar with other technologies, including battery storage. So um, with a another energy co-op actually, uh, Chelwood Community Energy and um, a, a local tech company called CPro, we set up an organisation called the Microgrid Foundry, uh, and that was uh, to spur on the development of microgrids. So basically, what a microgrid is. It, on a new build housing estate, um, rather than put a, a gas boiler into every house, we we have solar panels on the roof. There's a heat heat pump for the hot water and the heating. They're very good and very energy efficient from the outset. Um, and there is battery storage, but rather than having one in each house, there's one big battery on site. And um, there's sort of smart software involved that 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 uses that generates electricity right across the site, stores it for later if required, and actually can also be used to um, keep the grid stable as well, a bit like our, our first pilot battery did. So we funded two of those schemes now, one in Bristol um, and one in in, um, in uh, Bridport in Dorset. And they're really interesting. They really are quite cutting edge. And it, basically it was our challenge to the big housing developers, you know, we can do this, why can't you? Why are you still building out houses that have virtually no solar on the roof and you're still putting gas boilers in? Um, so that's that's what we're doing on, on that one. Mm. And then the third one is, this is going back to slightly, the big battery servicing the grid is a few years ago in, in Bristol and across the country, there are a state of ha uh, planning applications submitted by big developers to install diesel peaking plants. So what these were was when 
the grid did need a burst of additional electricity, these companies would get paid for uh, starting up diesel generators and produce electricity from there and, and, and put it into the grid. And there's a very quite lucrative contracts around this. So they were very keen to do this. And some of these in Bristol were sited at like really near a nursery school. And it, it reckon it was equivalent of 96 diesel bus engines chugging away a few hundred yards from nursery school. So the community really fought this off. And we were part of that fight. Um, and in the end, they didn't go through, they, they didn't get funding permission. And since then on two of those sites, battery storage has since been installed instead. Um, and we're now involved with one of those schemes, uh, again in Bristol. Uh, and we're, that's with a joint venture with Thrive Renewables, who I'm sure lots of you will know, Bristol based as well. Um, and so basically, yeah, we, we, we've part funded that bridge battery scheme. It's pretty big in terms of um, 20 megawatt hours is its capacity. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, 20 megawatts capacity, and it could potentially run for one and a half hours to providing, I think, like 30 megawatt hours. And yeah, we've got an option. We've already funded some of that. And through the share offer, we're looking to fund more of that as well. And this is this is big. I mean, this is the, 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 these are schemes that, are, again, are being built out across the country right now and at scale and growing more and more. And then going back to my point earlier about, you know, we, we do have a ways of dealing with intermittency of renewables. Um, and so we're really pleased to be part of this. And it's such a powerful story that, you know, what was going to be diesel generators is, 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 is now battery storage. And we were working really closely with those communities, looking to do an awful lot more with them. And, and across Bristol, looking at how we can almost like use you know, battery storage alongside, say, big rooftop solar schemes and make that the, the center point of a local energy system. Yeah, that's, that's actually really impressive. I mean, a lot of people think just adding a battery to a system is quite trivial. Technically, it might be, but for making the economic model work behind it is actually really hard. So hats off to you for doing it and pulling it off. Um, it's something we'd love to do. We try to get some grants to do it because without being able to forecast the financial return from it, we considered it too risky to use bondholder money to do. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd love to sort of share this experience. And we've got a couple of schools who would love to have a battery too. So it'd be great to see if we could collaborate on something along those lines. Yeah. Well great. Done. Fantastic. Good to see you two connecting like that on <laughs> the call. Um, just JT uh, makes the point that renewables are mostly variable right. and predictable, not in intermittent. Which which applies on and off. Yeah. So it says makes that. says that's an important <laughs> point. So I just wanted to relay that out to the audience. Um, question for Robert. Robert, um, this is your eighth bond offer, or solar for schools, but eighth bond offer, I should say. And your long-term goal is for every UK school to have solar panels and they enabling them to deliver sustainability education for all pupils. So I'm reading that straight off from the script. Um, giving this next generation a feeling of being able to make a difference and giving them the education to make a difference in my view is uh, incredibly powerful this is the generation that's going to solve the climate crisis can, can you give some examples of how this has worked in practice you know i.e um children that have gone on to to do something maybe for instance or what it looks like in schools in terms of how they interact with with the solar projects and the education so, so one of the challenging parts of our business, while well, it's very easy to measure the carbon impact and the electricity impact, it's very hard to measure the indirect impact of the education. And we've looked into trying to do this, and the mobile app that we developed with grant funding could potentially be evolved further into then tracking what happens with when the student has learned. You know, can, can we somehow measure whether they've persuaded their parents to buy an electric car or not fly to Australia. Um, it's really hard to track that. So at the moment, we, 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 we believe that the impact of the education is up to 100 times greater than the direct impact on CO2, but hands on heart have no way of proving or measuring that uh, without probably uh, having to develop some quite sophisticated apps and probably uh, 
tricky issues around privacy, uh, especially with young students. But what we can talk about and, and, and demonstrate is what we do and the, and the services we provide in terms of education. And it sort of falls into sort of a number of, of buckets. The first one is the mobile app, which anyone can download. If you go to the Solar for Schools website and go to education, um, there's a, a link to where, how you can download it for Android or Apple. Um, and that was well received, but we're now going to have another grant to develop it further so that teachers can use it to um, for, for homework and then track where the students are. And that tracking of where the students are in that piece is the first step to eventually be able to track what results and what outcomes they, they achieve later. Um, so that's one. The second one is um, we... Uh, that sorry that mobile app also allows the students to develop a project on their own school so sometimes we're getting more inquiries and we're seeing the number of systems that are being designed on our website through the app so that's we can measure I guess um, the next bit is that with the income we get from looking after or managing the system we do an annual inspection visit and those inspection visits are done by uh, trained educators who then run workshops with the students um, and um, to provide training to the teachers as to how to use the data that we collect from the solar panels and the school so that they can start to monitor and manage their, their own energy consumption. So we have a whole lot of charts and lesson plans and graphs that are driven from the data from the schools in order to that to happen. And that means that teachers can then start linking real data to maths, physics, geography, uh, and ethics, actually, most mm. educational programs around ethics. Uh, using uh, solar in different countries um, to, to to drive that. And then the, yeah, I think I've covered it. So it's the management of the systems, the real-time data. Oh yes, and when we visit the site, the, the, the sites too, we've now just implemented a new um, learning opportunity, which is the engineer runs wanders around inspecting the solar panels on a roof with a camera that's linked back into the classroom and the classroom can then ask questions about the solar panels while they're doing it to make it even more tangible. Brilliant. So the number of activities like that that we're doing, the amount that we can do on that is A, dependent on the number of schools, each school effectively for the revenue that we uh, make from looking after them adds up into a pot and that pot gets larger the more schools we have, which allows us to invest more in, in the educational materials. Yeah, brilliant. It's but I'm very keen to actually tackle some of the questions, if I may. Yeah, please do, far away. Yeah, go for it. And, and, and so it's slightly embarrassing. There are two tax related questions that I'm not entirely sure I follow. Um, so I'd like some clarification on that's possible. One, which is environmental tax relief um, being removed from solar schools. Uh, we've never had to pay it so far. So I'm, I'm, I haven't heard about uh, environmental tax relief, or maybe I've misunderstood it. So it'd be interesting to understand a little bit more about what that is. And there's another sort of tax related one, which is around uh, stamp duty tax relief. Uh, again, I haven't come across this we do pay rates um but i'm not familiar with those two so i'm curious that i've seen two things that i haven't come across before yeah could be or could also be to do with coming from a um you know maybe a, a limited liability company versus a community benefit society that might have something to do with it i don't know so maybe there's a but once more clarification from that or i'd love to have a chat with either of you afterwards to understand that a bit better um, then on the next question, there's uh, geographical reach on solar for schools. Uh, so UK wide, although most of the schools are in England, um, we haven't done any in Wales or Scotland, not for any particular reason. It's just that that seems to be where schools contact us from. Um, if you go to our website, solarforschools.co.uk, and you click on schools, you can then see our schools and you can see a map of all the, all the schools we've currently completed in the UK. Um, and we're about to add a feature to be able to see the upcoming schools too. Uh, and also if you go to our website on that point, you can look up your own school and see what its solar potential would be. That's fantastic. I would definitely, I would definitely recommend that the audience uh, does that. Great way to interact. Andy, any 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 thoughts on the questions from your your side? Yeah, yeah. On the um, tax relief, uh, 
so Lauren said it's actually for the investor. Yeah, I think what she, she's possibly referring to is what, in fact, unfortunately, it's not there for us anymore. There are two. There used to be the Enterprise Investment Scheme. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, and some stage maybe SITR, which is Social Investment Tax Relief. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, neither of those are available to community energy at the moment. Um, government got rid of it all. Uh, yeah, there are two. Yeah, ISA is still available. So bonds can be ISA'd through ethics. Um, shares can't, but shares do have the possibility of being inheritance tax relief um, beneficiaries in that if the organization qualifies uh, and you pass away, your descendants can receive those shares um, tax-free, which for some investors could be 40%. But this is quite a edge sophisticated part of inheritance tax law. So you definitely want to go through an advisor on that one. Yeah, definitely want to go through an advisor on that one. I, I concur. Um, so, okay, well, I mean, sure, Andy, okay. you go. Yeah, can I go back to um, Robert Jones's question? Uh, mm. Looking to start a, uh, a group, community energy group, and where would we go for advice? Um, I mean, originally when we when we did set up, we got well, actually we got a little bit of startup funding from the council, which was very helpful, um, and then we got some support from Cooperatives UK, um, another organisation who do provide quite a lot of uh, support now is Power to Change. So they've got a number of, of grants and things you could go for, and they may, may match fund the initial crowdfunding. The other route I, I would go down is um, find out who the, the law firms are in your area, the, the bigger law for, firms that have, say, a, you know, a national reach, have a local office, and talk to them. There will be people there who would be keen to actually help out, and they may well do some pro bono as well. You know, it's part of their... Yeah, um, it, everybody wants to be helping out with these things now, but actually, you know, genuinely, they will have people in there who would, would jump at the choice, at the chance to be doing that sort of work for a community group. And maybe also in terms of finance, maybe talk to some of the local accountancy firms, the bigger accountancy firms, and see if you can get the same sort of thing. Um, the other thing I'd say just generally is really try and share the load. Um, you know, there'll be some people who are great at social media and can't stand admin and vice versa. So if you get all those people around doing the different bits and pieces, you can really share the load and that that so helps to avoid burnout because if you don't have that, um, yeah, it's quite easy to sort of crash and burn in the, the first year or two. Great. That's that's great advice, Sandy. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got a, a few more questions coming through, but I we kind of pretty much at our, our allotted time. So is there a burning desire to answer any more questions there, uh, Robert and Andy? Oh, I thought we had another 12 minutes, but um, it, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to go on, yeah. yeah. Um, so the school's question, that excess production. So that's a really good question because, yes, schools are in effect closed nearly 50% of the year, especially if you factor in that they tend to be closed in the summer when the sun is shining the most. Uh, and so, yes, export is a massive uh, consideration. So the, the, the balance is trying to size the system so that you don't export too much. Um, and what typically some happens is on a small system, you would export very little. It all gets used by the school, but you're not covering very much of the school's overall use. As the system gets larger, a disproportionately larger and larger portion then goes back into the grid. And then that means... If you're only getting three and a half pence in the grid and you're getting 12 or 15 people in the school, it starts to push the PPA price up to the school. So typically what happens, you show a school a smallish system using about a half of their roof at a low PPA. And then they go, well, actually, what would happen if you fill the entire roof? And then you show them what the PPA price would be for the larger system. And then you find the balance. And actually, interesting enough, a lot of schools will go for slightly higher PPA and more solar. Um, because sometimes you also get a greater savings because the total number of kilowatt hours is greater. Um, what happens to the, what is exported is we assume it's going to be worth very little. Um, and at the moment, in the last year or two, it's been worth a lot. So that's been nice. It's been a sort of nice uh, bonus back to the schools. Um, but it's increasingly hard to predict what export prices will be five, 10 years out. 
Um, mm. and at some point, you'll start to put batteries in, which is why I was very interested in what the work Andy is doing. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of a, the, the, the amount, the self sizing is determined by our calculator and optimized around trying to balance the lowest possible PPA with the highest possible savings for the school. And the export is sold to the grid um, at market rates at the moment. Uh, we have considered some sleeving, but haven't done anything yet. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that. Sorry, I was just going to I was just going to jump in and say uh, uh, this is from 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 David. It says at present, are you able to attract all the investment you need by offering five percent? Depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't know is the answer uh, on our current offer. We raised the first half a million within a week, uh, and the second hundred and fifty thousand, or the next hundred and fifty thousand over the next four weeks. Yeah. Um, That's pretty common, though, to be honest, to get that type of pattern. So we need to raise. I mean, we've got seven and a half megawatts of projects in our pipeline, plus whatever comes in over the next few months, um, and we're getting about four inquiries a day from schools. Uh, the conversion ratio of that is pretty terrible, uh, for the reasons we discussed already. Uh, but yeah, we would need to raise six to eight million this year and not sure. I hope we can. Otherwise, we'll have to increase the interest rate and do less schools. Mm. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, I mean, we're in the same position. You know, every, every time we start a share offer, we never know what's going to happen. And, you know, the, and the, the product we choose, because we've had actually done bonds in the past as well, um, and the interest rate is is based on a lot of discussions with all sorts of people, including the good people at FX. Um, and then we, we go for something which has to be also um, conservative in terms of we have to make our projects work. So we know we can't offer too attractive a rate if it just means the projects aren't, aren't viable. And you know there are always some projects which are less viable than others, but you really want to do because they've got a very good community benefit story to them, if you, so to speak. And so, you know, we try and keep ours low. And, you know, our message so much now is that, you know, yes, you're investing for a financial return, but also just as much for social return and an environmental. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of money now on, on promoting our share offers. Um, we've just taken on additional staff to do all this. And um, we, we see the share offers as much as a chance to tell people about community energy and about the wider energy picture generally as us raising the money yeah um, but also we need to do both yeah robert no i agree with that i mean why don't we go to a bank and i think we could but the the benefit of involving wider society in those offers accelerates the pace of change too um, and i think that's and also from a school's perspective they, they kind of like the idea that it's parents and grandparents funding the system on their roof it creates a sort of a bit of a community thing rather than a bank. Mm. Uh, what we are considering is offering an inheritance tax um, based version. The rate of interest will be the same or even less, uh, but there the driver is not the interest rate, but the point to pass money on to the next generation, uh, which in a way kind of fits in what we're trying to do. We're trying to sort of help the next generation. So it kind of fits. Uh, we're still exploring that. Yeah. But it plans to increase the interest rates at the moment. Yeah, no, that's those are great answers. I think it's really important to get the, the point across that it's it's a fair rate of return that's needed to attract investment. And there are all these other really important ex, externalities or community benefits that are is really driving the show. Because I don't think any of any of us would be here if we weren't in it for the for the impact and the community benefits. So important to get that point across. So um Thanks very much to you both, Andy and Robert. Um, if, you know, a bit of an opportunity to, to for a call to action. If if you if you'd like to to do that, or if not, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, so now's your moment. If you if you want to sum up why the why um, people should be investing in the offer, my call to action really was: please get the message out that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, and that this government can be spending huge amounts of money on fossil fuel subsidies. That really is my biggest message because the sooner we get that, the sooner the whole 
system is going to change and you know, we can do our bit through community energy investment but the key bit is changing the fundamental structure of, of the way our energy is at the moment where we get it from how it's funded etc etc quite I, important one today is we have local elections in lots of part of the country as well so uh, you do use your vote wisely <laughs> this is not a party political broadcast Andy. <laughs> I just, I've got to the point now where this is so important to say all this. Yeah. You know, it's, it really is crucial. You know, I can't look my children in the eye anymore and not do this. It's, it's that crucial. Yeah. yeah. I, I completely agree with that. I, I, to put solar on just all the schools in the UK is about 1.9 billion. The government hasn't got the money to do it. We know that because we're talking to them about it. They've got a couple of hundred million, which they're trying to allocate efficiently to top up the ones that don't work, which maybe they might use our tool to do that. But the key point is, if we are going to decarbonize, it's down to us individually to vote with our money. Um, and renewables are a pretty safe place to put money. Not offering advice here, but you know, as someone said, uh, renewables are variable and predictable, not intermittent. It's true. Um, from year to year, they vary a little bit, but it's pretty predictable. And as long as those systems are looked after and monitored and managed, they should generate a good revenue. I always said to people, if you want to invest in high risk, invest in options, the company developing the software. If you want to invest in low risk, low return, put money in the bonds. Or someone, or, or, or an energy, a community energy group shares, you know, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much both. So um, Solar for Schools offers open until 30th of June, um, almost halfway there. Um, and Beck's offer is open to 17th of July. So, so we'll be sending updates on those and progress reports with the video highlights. Please do uh, visit the website to review the offers. So I'd like to say thank you for your time once again to Andy and Robert and to the audience for participating. And just remains for Andy and Robert to say thanks and goodbye to the audience. Yeah, thanks very much for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all your questions, too. Brilliant. Great. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.